Hi guys, BKC here. I've been the writer for the singles portions of False Wipes videos for about two years now, which means that every joke you haven't liked has probably been my fault. You're welcome. Today I'm grabbing the spotlight for myself so I can tell you about one of my favorite Pokemon, Skarmory. It can fly at 180 miles an hour, or 300 kilometers an hour, and I always thought it was really cool how Steven Stone flew around Hoenn on one. Also, the opening scene of Pokemon Coliseum where Skarmory flies out over the desert sets the tone in a way few other Pokemon games can match. But today we are going to examine Skarmory's impact on the competitive scene, so we ask, how great was Skarmory actually? Actually. And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Unfortunately, Skarmory wasn't very good in its debut generation. I'm just kidding, I just wanted to say that. Skarmory was, of course, one of the most important Pokemon in GSC. If you're familiar with competitive Pokemon, you know the legends of the unkillable walling duo Skarm Bliss, or how Skarmory famously stacks multiple layers of spikes. Well, neither of those things were really the case in Gen 2. Blissey was unable to damage opposing Pokemon at all, making it a rare sight. Plus, not only did spikes only only have one layer, but Skarmory didn't even get the move. So what made Skarm such a big deal? One very simple reason. It was one of the best answers to the single best Pokemon in the generation, Snorlax. While it wasn't a perfect counter to everything Snorlax could do, it did endlessly thwart Snorlax's most dangerous sets, and for this reason it was a requirement on any serious stall team. It was the only true counter to Earthquake Snorlax in the entire game, as it was the only normal resist that didn't care about Earthquake. Well, besides Eric. Aerodactyl, but Aerodactyl was frail and terrible, so that didn't really count. While Growl Miltank and Charm Umbreon were good at stalling out Curse Earthquake Snorlax one-on-one, -on -one, they still got hit really hard by Double Edge on the Switch, especially with Spikes down, were hindered greatly by status, and their attack-lowering strategy stood no chance against Belly Drum Lax. Skarmory had none of that. It wasn't affected by Spikes, it walled Double Edge for days, even if status, and with Curse, it could fend off even the mighty Drum Lax. Thus, it was completely irreplaceable on stall. Also, Growl Tank and Charmbreon stood no chance against another mighty physical threat in Swords Dance Marowak, but Skarm thwarted it, once again thanks to Curse as well as its immunity to Marowak's mighty stab Earthquake. Now, Snorlax did sometimes run Fire Blast or Flamethrower almost solely so it wouldn't be walled by Skarmory. However, that meant it gave up another crucial move, either coverage, a boosting move, or rest, depending on the set, making it easy Easier to either play around or wall, depending. For this reason, the combination of Skarmory and a rock or ghost type was common, such as Tyranitar or Misdravis, respectively, as it allowed its user to check Curse Rest Snorlax, the most common and dangerous variant, whether it chose Earthquake or Fire Blast for its coverage. Skarm's amazing typing and massive bulk made it incredibly resilient as a whole, as it floated above spikes and resisted explosion, making it incredibly difficult to take out. It was also particularly good at walling most variants of the dangerous Exeggutor, preventing it from getting a crucial boom off on one of Skarm's teammates like Raikou or Zapdos. Every good GSC offense team needed to have a plan for getting past Skarmory and its special wall friends, usually Raikou in addition to the obligatory Snorlax, or else they would just flail haplessly as it stalled them out. It was particularly irritating if it got into a groove with Whirlwind and started racking up spikes on the opponent, which put the opposing team on an even faster timer for breaking through. For example, Machamp was excellent in part because its stab cross chop was one of the very few physical attacks that could potentially break through Skarm if set up correctly, but it could not hope to beat Skarm one on one thanks to Skarm's super effective stab drill peck and its higher speed. So if Skarm started whirlwinding it in and slowly eroded its health through spikes as Champ repeatedly ran from the matchup only to be dragged back in, then one of the opponent's few options for breaking through Skarm would have its odds significantly worsened. Overall, its debut generation was where Skarmory first made its name as a legendary physical wall. It was the most reliable option there was for fending off the variants of Snorlax that trucked through quite literally everything else, i.e. the most dangerous Lax variants, and came to define much of the GSC metagame through its walling prowess.
Skarmory received a ton of buffs in Generation 3. It learned Spikes, which now went up to three layers, and combined with Tyranitar's permanent Sandstorm for easily set up incredibly powerful passive damage. With the introduction of Split EVs as well as Power Creep with Choice Band and boosting moves like Dragon Dance, it wasn't as much of a wall anymore, but it still staved off a ton of the metagame, especially as it resisted nearly all the physical moves now boosted by the new Choice Band. And its Spikes, Phasing, and Occasional Toxic wore opposing teams down with incredible ease. It was a staple of one of the most dangerous team styles in advance, the TSS teams, or the Toxic Spike Sandstorm teams, which focused more on dishing out as much passive damage as possible. Skarmory was incredibly resilient itself thanks to its immunity to all three of Toxic Spikes and Sandstorm. No other Pokemon was immune to all three. Also, this was the generation where the Skarm Bliss combo took off and established itself as one of Pokemon's foremost household names. While the two were not immovable, they were immensely reliable at switching back and forth between physical and special attacks while wearing the opponent down with passive damage. Plus, Blissey could keep Skarmory healthy with Wish, further solidifying the duo's longevity in the face of opposing attacks. Now, Skarmory did have a foil in the form of Magneton and its newly gained ability Magnet Pull, which let it trap Skarm and slam it with Thunderbolt. Mag's sole reason for existence was pretty much just KOing Skarm, and entire team styles, mostly physical offense, were born from its ability to take Skarm out of the game. Devoting a team slot to a potentially useless Pokemon like Magneton just to remove Skarm spoke to how utterly dominant and potentially unkillable Skarm was. Plus, Skarm was so good that even with Magneton in the picture, it thrived and remained one of the absolute best Pokemon in the metagame. Spikes were so powerful, especially in Sand, that even if Magneton removed Skarmory, the one layer Skarm would leave behind would help its team immensely. Especially defensive Skarmory also almost always survived Thunderbolt, allowing it to get a second layer of Spikes or phase the Magneton out, with the latter allowing the Skarm user to preserve it and have crucial death fodder for later in the game. Plus, it was not like Skarm was necessarily helpless against Mag. Though so it required tough prediction, the Skarm player could potentially switch out as Mag came in to attempt to trap the Skarm and trap it back with Dugtrio, removing it from the game and giving Skarm free reign. Even one's own Magneton could potentially toy with other Mag, especially if the opposing Mag was running Hidden Power Grass and not Fire. Finally, some players even ran offensive HP ground Skarmory sets, which were more unreliable overall due to their lack of defensive investment, but could completely turn the table on Mag. Now, though it may seem like it, Skarm was not merely a defensive spreader of passive damage. Yes, that was what it excelled at, but that did not mean it only fit on defensive teams. In fact, the TSS teams where it shone brightest were more offensive than anything else. Oh sure, they had bulky Pokemon and loved their residual damage, but their aim was not to switch around endlessly until the opponent ran out of HP. No, they wanted to force their opponent into a situation where they could no longer handle the TSS team's offensive threats. And Skarm's spikes hitting every non-flying and levitating Pokemon were a huge part of enabling these offensive threats. The best example was Aerodactyl, tied for the fastest Pokemon in the tier, who most TSS teams anchored on to clean the opposition up late game. In its own right, Aerodactyl was a strong offensive Pokemon, and with Sandstorm limiting the longevity of bulky Pokemon like Suicune, it was already difficult to counter. However, the the metagame's number one physical wall, Swampert, was immune to Sandstorm and switched into Arrow all day. Now, Swampert was pretty resilient, but with Spikes in the picture, Spikes that Skarmory set up effortlessly in Swampert's face, by the way, then Swampert would struggle to switch into Arrow more than a few times. Spikes were great at supporting Pokemon with grounded counters as a whole. In a similar vein to Arrow, Dragon Dance Tyranitar's boosted stab rock slides cut through flying types, meaning that it was mostly Spikes vulnerable Pokemon that checked it. Thus, Skarmory was huge in turning all already dangerous threats into absolute monsters with very little effort. It didn't just do this by laying spikes though. It forced damage on opponent's Pokemon they didn't want switching in through Whirlwind, and could take this even further with Taunt, which prevented Blissey from healing and made it easy prey for its teammates later on. Gaining an advantage over opposing Skarmory was incredibly useful as well. Skarm's impact on the advanced metagame cannot be overstated and could be felt in every intricacy of the tier, from how it was one of the few Pokemon able to quell Heracross's mighty Megahorn, to how it forced Choice Spin Metagross 
Andros to immediately sacrifice itself with Explosion just to prevent Skarmory from getting even a single layer of spikes down, to how teams loaded with special attacks still struggle to break through it without sustaining crippling spikes and toxic in return, to how the entire lifespan of the third generation metagame, players have built their teams around limiting it, and yet, even in the face of anti-Skarmory techniques such as Rapid Spin around every corner, it's still dominated. Matter of fact, some players in the past even clamored for its ban, or at least for it to only be allowed to set up one or two layers of spikes. Skarmory in Advance OU was as excellent and metagame defining as Pokemon come. The fourth generation was power crept like hell, and in addition to all the buffed base power moves like Close Combat and Focus Blast, further boosted by all the life orbs and choice specs flying around, the new physical special split meant Skarmory no longer resisted nearly every physical attack in the game. However, Skarm got several buffs of its own. First off, it finally gained instant recovery and roost. It also received Stealth Rock, but since rocks were learned by pretty much everything, including Skarm's favorite partner, Blissey, and spikes had more limited distribution, it preferred to focus on spiking. However, it did loved the addition of rocks as they complemented spikes beautifully, both hitting the flying and levitating Pokemon that hovered above spikes as well as providing even more damage on grounded Pokemon. Magneton received an upgrade in the form of its evolution Magnezone, but Skarmory could now escape the clutches of Magnet Pole with a new item Shed Shell. Of course, Leftover's recovery was preferred so it did not have to manually heal off little hits like U-turns with Stealth Rock up, but the fact that it had the option to single-handedly ruin the strategy Magnezone teams were built around was amazing in and of itself, thus being able to thwart teams loaded with dangerous physical attackers like Scizor, Kingdra, Gyarados, and Dragonite. Skarm's ability to shrug off the newly buffed Outrage in particular was invaluable, especially when the dangerous Swords Dance Garchomp was still allowed. Plus, the greater overall power level meant Skarm was not as unkillable as in the previous generation, meaning Magnezone at the height of his usage was never nearly as popular as Magneton was in advance. Anyway, speaking of that which was prominent in Gen 3, Skarm Bliss was as powerful as ever in the new generation, spreading increased residual damage with Stealth Rock hitting everything, as well as the potential addition of Toxic Spikes limiting option to break through them even more. The pair thrived even in the face of the famed Skarm Bliss killer mixed in Infernape, especially when paired with Cresselia in the early stages of Diamond and Pearl. Many an inexperienced player clamored for the duo, or the trio in Skarm Bliss Cress's case, to be banned. Cress fell off as Platinum came and introduced Scizor in the Rotom appliance as well as eventually Latios, but Skarm Bliss remained strong throughout the generation. Finally, Skarm received an upgrade to its stab as it went from the rather unimpressive Drill Peck to the surprisingly powerful Brave Bird, whose recoil was minimal and provided big smacks on not only Pokemon Skarm checked, such as the aforementioned physical attackers, but also on Pokemon that often tried to switch into it, like Starmie and Infernape. Skarm wasn't just a physical wall though. When invested in special defense, as it did when Latias first dropped down to the tier and began raining Specs Draco meteors everywhere, it was an excellent special tank as well, capable of shrugging off a ton of special attackers like Gengar, an offensive Suicune, and generally being nearly impossible to KO without an invested Stab, Thunderbolt, or Fire Blast, which meant it remained the standard set even once Latias was banned. With Taunt to wear down Blissey it had whirlwinded in and Rotom appliances to thwart rapid spin attempts from Fortress, Skarm was excellent excellent at setting up scenarios for teammates like Calmine Jirachi to clean up while being a terrific defensive fallback against much of the metagame's threats. It was also one of the better methods of dancing around the incredibly dangerous Salamence, as it could easily absorb the Draco Meteor Mixments loved to lead off with and could survive a Fire Blast from Dragon Dance variants while phasing it out. That said, it certainly was thankful Salamence was eventually banned, and the semi-stall style Skarm so stood out on became even more difficult to deal with without one of its biggest threats around. Eventually, the residual damage immune Clefable popped up, which at first seemed like a threat to the team Skarm anchored, and it was, but it also turned out to be a great asset for them, as Knockoff crippled and wore down the opposition even further while Magic Guard helped its team remain stalwart in the face of opposing residual damage, especially as Toxic Spice were more popular with the excellent Skarm Clef partner Nita Queen also rising in usage. As these new Skarm Clef Nito teams made their mark on the metagame, dangerous physical threats like Superpower Breloom and Choice Band Gyarados appeared to power through them. That is until Skarmory adopted physical defense investment again and shrugged them off with ease, making its teams even more difficult to break through. All in all, despite not being an offensive threat, Skarmory was once again one of the best, most important, definitive Pokemon throughout every single stage of the fourth generation of OU. Skarm was also excellent in Ubers. It shrugged off all the choice Draco Meteors, Outrages, and Spatial Rens flying around. It dominated the bulky and often choice steals used to check those same Draco Meteors, Outrages, and Spatial Rens such as Choice Pants Scizor and Choice Scarf Jirachi. It walled the majority of Groudon sets. It walled most Dragon Dance and Swords Dance Rayquaza. It completely 
heavily stuffed Garchomp, and its spikes wore down dangerous, often choice threats like Kyogre. Skarm's resistances in Whirlwind forced the opponent to switch around, and switching around was of course painful thanks to the spikes. Spikes also made Skarm's partner Pokemon like Latios even more dangerous. Skarm had to be careful with Ubers' weather dynamic, as it would crumple two potential sun-boosted fire moves and rain-boosted water moves, as well as perfect accuracy thunder, but on the other hand, it would shrug off rain-weakened fire moves like Giratina Origins Hidden Power Fire and sun-weakened water moves like Palkia locked into Hydro Pump without a problem, while 50% accurate thunders were not something the opponent wanted to be throwing out. In short, Skarm was amazing. Gen 5 shook OU with its cascade of monstrous behemoths, and Skarmory was there to stand in their way. It wasn't too good against most rain teams, apart from checking the occasional Toxicroak, and Ferrothorn was a better choice as a hazard supporting steel on those rain teams since it was able to withstand Latios' rain boosted surfs, but physically defensive Skarmory was the best Pokemon for sand teams against opposing sand teams and their terrifying sand abusers, Sandrush Excadrill, Sandforce Landorus, and good old Garchomp. Against these, as well as other common Pokemon like Conkeldur, Verizion, and Swords Dance Poison Heal Gliscor, it was nigh immovable. It walled them, it phased them out, it stayed healthy with Roost, and it laid spikes for good measure, chipping at even the things it couldn't quite wall, like Terrakion. It wasn't just the sand-abusing ground types that Skarmory was crucial in holding off, though. Dragon types were more dangerous than ever, with Garchomp's return, Dragonite gaining multi-scale, and the freakishly powerful Haxorus. Even when forced to run Shed Shell by the influx of Magnezone, even when it had to play around Smackdown Landorus making it vulnerable to Earthquake, Skarm held the metagame together. Eventually, OU calmed down quite a bit. Garchomp was banned, and Excadrill followed. As a bonus, Drag Mag teams had a major drop in usage. Sandvale Flying Gem Acrobatics Gliscor rose to take Garchomp's place, but neither it nor the Subtoxic Poison Heal set were nearly as dangerous as Chomp. With the significantly less frenetic pace of the metagame, Skarmory no longer had game after game of just barely holding off threat after threat for its team, and was able to focus more on spiking. It remained a centerpiece of the metagame, but less as a necessary defense wall and more as an effective residual damage component of the newly hazards and sand focused metagame that lasted through the end of black and white one. Sandstall teams were especially effective since Rain had lost a major threat when Thunderous was banned alongside Excadrill. Since Skarm was no longer scrounging for every bit of recovery it could get with leftovers or avoiding Magnezone with Shed Shell, it was free to explore a new item, Rocky Helmet, which piled on even more residual damage and was particularly useful for chipping Pokemon like Fortress and Starmie attempting to rapid spin again. Against it, allowing Skarm to win long-term wars of attrition. It was also nice against offensive teams, punishing Dragonite, Acrobatics, Gliscor, and Scizor's U-turns, with his last part being especially useful when the metagame was overrun by the combination of Volt Switch and U-turn known as Volturn. Never for a minute was Skarmory not one of the best, most important Pokemon in Black and White 1. Then Black and White 2 came and turned the metagame on its head. Rain came back with a vengeance, releasing monsters like Keldeo, Thunderous Therian, and Tornadus Therian. Landorus also got a new Therian form, but that wasn't all. Its regular form, now known as the Incarnate form, received Sheer Force, turning it into a violently powerful special attacker further powered up by Life Orb that didn't have recoil on Earth Power and Focus Blast due to their secondary effects. Genesect was shredding the entire metagame. Finally, shortly into Black and White 2's existence, Garchomp was unbanned and Kieran Black followed soon after. So how did Skarmory fit into this metagame? The answer was with the return of the specially defensive set. Even without physical defense investment, it was still an excellent counter to Garchomp and Landorus Therian, and its newfound special bulk allowed it to stave off Life Orb and Specs Tornadus Therian's hurricanes and focus blasts all day while not being at all prone to its common partner Dugtrio. Rain teams were more offensive than ever and rarely stopped a spin, meaning Skarm spikes tended to go up uncontested and thus chipped away at the dangerous Genesect and Keldeo. It also helped somewhat against Landorus Incarnate. While it wasn't able to switch into the sheer force, pun intended, of Focus Blast for fear of being cleanly 2 it KO'd through leftovers, it took just little enough to be able to roost stall Lando in a one-on-one -on -one situation. With how much of a threat Lando was, anything a team could do to withstand it was valuable. Thus, Skarm's ability to check it if it found its way in on an Earth Power or HP Ice was a major boon, since Lando was famous for ransacking the bulky team Skarm was such a major part of. Eventually, the metagame calmed down once again. Genesect was banned, Tornadus Therian was banned, Deoxys Defense was banned, and Landorus Incarnate was banned, meaning that once again, bulky hazard stacking sand teams took over, with Skarmory as integral a piece of them as ever. It still ran especially defensive spread, as this let it fulfill the invaluable role of an Alakazam check unaffected by spikes. 
However, for the first time, it was not purely a Pokemon seen on defensive teams. The Deoxys defense ban was pertinent not only because DoD Hyper Offense was difficult for defensive teams to handle, thus making those defensive teams better post-ban, but also because players were searching for a new Hyper Offense suicide lead able to replicate what DoD did. Turns out Skarm was the best choice with a brand new Custat Berry set. Now, Gen 5 had buffed Sturdy to become a built-in Focus Sash, but for the most part, Skarm only ever used it in emergencies, such as sacrificing itself to check Volcarona with Brave Bird. However, with this new set, it was making use of it on a game-to-game -game basis. With Sturdy, it would survive any hit to get up rocks, and on the next turn, the Custat Berry would activate, allowing Skarmory to go first, either getting up a second layer of spikes or KOing itself with Brave Bird to prevent rapid spin attempts. It also packed Taunt to prevent opposing rocks from slower Pokemon like Hippowdon, making it an all-around solid lead choice. And just like that, Skarmory was the new face of Hyper Offense. Of course, its primary role was still as a spike stacking anchor of bulky sand. Eventually, the metagame shifted from favoring sand teams to completely revolving around them, with Skarmory spikes fully abused by the Magic Guard psychic types, Reuniclus, and the aforementioned Alakazam. Skarm's spike immunity and instant recovery meant it was favored over Ferrothorn, allowing it to fully engage in the long battles those teams shone in. To combat this metagame, Excadrill was unbanned with the caveat that Sandrush sets could not be used on sand teams, as Sand Force and Mold Breaker sets had been released. Thus, Skarm became more important for sand teams than ever. Unlike Ferrothorn, it could switch in on, check, and spike against any variant of Excadrill all day, which strangely enough was important against Rain because that was a style using Sand Rush Drill. Eventually, Rush Drill was banned as a whole, and the metagame shifted slightly more to Tentacruel Rain with Thunderous Therian, which in conjunction with Latios and Rotom Wash's huge popularity led to a rise in Ferrothorn. Dragmag also experienced a resurgence in popularity, and Skarm could no longer afford to run Shed Shell, as Leftovers and Rocky Helmet were simply too important. However, even if Skarm got trapped, its spikes would remain valuable, and it would often take a Banded Cure in Black or Dragonite with it, with repeated outrages racking up Rocky Helmet damage. This allowed its user to preserve their secondary physical check for the Scarf Garchomp waiting in the wings on their Drag Mag using opponent's team. However, even at this, its lowest point, a far cry from the near-necessary place it held in the metagame before, Skarmory never ceased to be an excellent important Pokemon as a whole for its efficiency in dealing with opposing sand, especially since it handled threats as huge as Excadrill and Alakazam, and nearly every sand team had one of those too. All in all, Skarmory was one of the most important Pokemon in the fifth generation of OU. Throughout its entirety, it held the metagame together against several of the biggest threats around while reliably laying down its trademark spikes. Skarm was solid in Ubers once again. Ferrothorn was a better Pokemon overall since it was an amazing check to King Kyogre and Leech Seed was simply impossible to switch into, but Skarmory countered the mighty Extreme Killer Arceus and got the better of Ferrothorn thanks to Taunt. This, in conjunction with its spikes immunity and instant recovery, allowed it to slice through stall teams relying on Pokemon like Chansey and Jirachi, as well as safely forcing most other Arceus forms like Ghost, Fighting, Dark, Grass, and Ground to burn through their Recover PP quickly, lest they fold to accumulated spikes damage. As always, it shrugged off choice dragon moves with ease and staved off most variants of Groudon. It also countered Excadrill, who was dangerous in Ubers as well, and was one of the best sponges for Choice Scarf Genesect's U-turn. The metagame's greater power with new Pokemon like Kyurem White and Zekrom, in addition to old threats in Kyogre and Palkia, meant that Skarm's overall walling capabilities were diminished, but it remained a solid, useful Pokemon for many bulkier teams. Generation 6's Defog buff bestowed a new role upon Skarmory, whereas before it laid down the hazards, now it got rid of them. However, for the duration of the XY metagame, it wasn't too good. It was mostly just used as a necessary evil and weak stall teams, unable to dish out any damage and thus barely doing anything more than passively countering the occasional Mega Pinsir. It couldn't even reliably do its job of keeping Stealth Rock off, as it lost hard to common users of the move, notably Heatran, but as a whole, the part where Defog had less PP than Stealth Rock didn't do it any favors, as it meant that it wasn't going to beat even things it should be beating in theory like Garchomp and Ferrothorn in the long run. However, once Aorus came around, players realized that Defog didn't actually make Spikes not worthwhile, and began using Spike Skarmory again. It almost instantly became a metagame juggernaut once more. In addition to it spiking all over the place, its ability to stave off the terrifying Aorus edition of Mega Metagross was invaluable, as it racked up Chip with Rocky Helmet and could withstand even Thunder Punch. Walling 
Swords Dance Gliscor was excellent as well. After Mega Meta failed to get banned, its usage dropped for a while, and Skarm shifted to a specially defensive spread once again. This allowed it to safely switch in on and spike against Latios, one of the tier's few defoggers. It also used Iron Head for stab. This allowed it to check several dangerous fairy type Megas, Mega Altaria, Mega Gardevoir, and Mega Diancie. Diancie was especially relevant, as its magic bounce would make Skarm spike on itself, but since it feared an Oko from Iron Head thanks to its quadruple weakness and couldn't even 2 a KO especially defensive Skarm with HP Fire, this wasn't a problem. Also, while it wasn't a Mega, one could never be too safe against Clefable, especially since Clef stood in the way of Skarm's strategy of crippling the opposition with spikes. While Iron Head wouldn't be 2 a KOing it, Calm Clefable would be 3 hit KO'd and forced to burn a lot of soft boiled PP, all while not threatening Skarmory even with leftovers. This was yet another cross generational example of how far special defense investment goes on Skarm. The specifics of Skarm's role shifted a few more times in accordance with the rises and falls of the offensive Pokemon around it in the metagame. Double defog teams with Sash Dug Trio had a brief surge in popularity. Turns out Skarmory wasn't such a bad defog user when it wasn't the only one on its team, and alongside Zapdos, it was excellent at denying opposing stealth rockers, facilitating Sash Dug to its full extent. Eventually, Dug Trio was banned and the strategy was no longer worthwhile. At the same time, Mega Metagross and Swords Dance Gliscor experienced resurgences, so Skarmory shifted back to a focus on a physically defensive set that handled them, unlike its spiking competition, Ferrothorn. Skarm's spikes immunity and instant recovery providing it with superb longevity were also significant in giving it several notable advantages over Pharaoh in the spike-laden, elongated balance wars that came to provide the Aorus landscape. With Mega Meta's regained popularity making the aforementioned fairy megas more or less obsolete, as well as Clefable running a bold nature quite often, the need for Iron Head dissipated, and Skarm began to explore some new options. Several players used a set of Spikes, Roost, Whirlwind, and Defog. This gave it flexibility, as it meant it could either lay the hazards or remove them, depending on what was needed in that specific situation for its team. Brave Bird was also used on occasion. Its main purpose was thwarting Mega Meta Cham and Mega Heracross, who were renowned for thrashing the balanced style of team Skarm found itself on, but it also turned Skarm into an emergency check with Sturdy against Superior and Volcarona. When physical offense teams with monsters like Belly Drum Azumarill and Swords Dance Bisharp in addition to Mega Metagross surge, Skarmory was there to stand in their way, potentially even using counter to bounce their powerful attacks back at them. Once again, here was a team style Skarm was more efficient against than Pharaoh. Overall, Skarmory got off to a slower start in this generation, but once it found its groove, it became an elite meta-defining Pokemon once again. Skarmory had a good niche in Ubers once again. The tier's main spiker was Klefki, since it was able to check the terrifying Xerneas, but Skarm was a great Pokemon nonetheless. With a physically defensive set, it staved off several of the tier's most dangerous Pokemon, such as Mega Salamence, Extreme Killer Arceus, Swords Dance Arceus Ground, and most variants of Rayquaza and Primal Groudon. It was also excellent against lesser seen but no less terrifying threats like Mega Mewtwo X and Mega Kangaskhan. As always, spikes were terrific, now more than ever with the amount of grounded Pokemon lacking leftovers. In addition to the plate-dependent Arceus, both Primals had to eschew leftovers in favor of their respective orbs, and Xerneas had to hold Power Herb. Skarm didn't have to fear Lottie Twins and Arceus forms defogging its spikes away either, as it would cripple them with the same toxic it would use against the offensive threats it checked, as well as preventing Ho-Oh from switching in safely. Overall, Skarmory was solid in ORS Ubers. Sun and Moon came out, and Skarmory established itself as one of the most important Pokemon on the Doug Trio stall teams that dominated the tournament scene, with Doug's attack stat receiving a major buff and thus making it even easier for it to pick off the few Pokemon threatening to break through these stall teams that were already difficult enough to handle to begin with. Skarm's ability to counter so many of the metagame's topmost threats, even those packing Z moves, made it invaluable. It staved off common stealth rockers Garchomp and Landorus Therian, though it had to be careful around Rocky MZ Swords Dance variants of the latter, as well as other dangerous swords dancers in Tapu Bulu, Kartana, and Mega Scizor. With a Spike's Defog set, it could choose between spiking up to wear the opposition down or Defog to preserve Doug's Sash, the latter made easier by its teammate Mega Sableye, handling several hazard setters it might not want to switch into, such as Ferrothorn. Furthermore, Doug's ability to remove Heatran made this core even nastier. If Skarm's team was running Ground DMZ Doug Trio, it didn't have a Sash that needed to be preserved, and thus Skarm could prioritize spiking, making it even easier for Doug to pick things off. As you may have been able to tell, 
hell, Doug Trio was what really drove the viability of these teams. And thus, when it was banned, Stahl took a huge, massive hit, and Skarmory basically dropped off the face of the planet. For the first time ever, it had steel flying competition that was a better choice on non-Stahl teams. Celesteela kept the ability to thwart Tapu Bulu and Kartana, but unlike Skarmory, it also had huge special defense, which allowed it to easily handle the dangerous Tapu Lele and Mega Alakazam. While specially defensive Skarm had been good against similar threats in the past, now they were simply too powerful. Not to mention that Stila actually threatened them with Okos thanks to its powerful heavy slam. Furthermore, while Stila didn't have Roost, it did have access to an absolutely incredible move in Leech Seed, wearing down opposing offensive Pokemon like Heatran and Magearna far more quickly than Skarmory could. Skarm's spikes were also easily replaceable. Spike's Greninja was everywhere, and so was Spike's Ferrothorn, which was incredible largely because it was so good against Greninja, Ash Greninja in particular. Outside of Stall, there wasn't that much of a reason to use Skarm when both its defensive utility and spikes were found on Pokemon that had far better matchups against the metagame at large. Stall had a few sporadic appearances still, and Skarm was used on some of those teams. It even used HP Fire for Kartana a few times, but it was no longer anywhere close to a requirement. For physical walls and or hazard clearers, those teams tended to prefer Pokemon that matched up better against the meta as a whole. This meant Pokemon like Poison Heal, Defog Gliscor, Defog Mega Scizor, Rapid Spin Avalug, Physically Defensive Tangrowth, Defog Zapdos, and Defog Moltres. However, turns out Skarm was better than it had been given credit for once it had been explored a little. Near the end of the generation, a few players did use Skarm outside of Stall with decent success. It combined the physical threat checking of Celesteela with the spiking capability of Ferrothorn, thus saving its team a slot, and all it required was utilizing different checks to Greninja and the Psychics. This opened up some interesting new avenues for team building. After all, Skarm did reliably check several dangerous threats, and spikes were always appreciated, especially as they opened up a move slot on the already dangerous Greninja. Toxic crippled several defoggers, namely Tornado Asterian as well as Rotom Wash and Scarflander Asterian. Against Hapu Fini, whose misty terrain shielded it against Toxic, Skarm could simply play to its strengths, the long game, as it easily stuck around with Roost and had more spikes PP than Fini had defog. It was especially easy to pressure Fini long term since Skarm would be paired with a Stealth Rocker. Despite it clearly being its worst generation thus far, Skarm was probably on the underrated side and should have been used more than it was in the seventh generation, as it showed it was still more than capable on the few occasions it did appear. In Ubers, Skarmory reprised its role from the previous generation, with a slightly expanded pool of Pokemon it checked. In addition to its previous repertoire of Mega Mance, Normal and Ground, Swords Dance Arceus, and Most Rayquaza and Primal Groudon, it was also a terrific check to Swords Dance Necrozma, both as Duskmane Necrozma and Ultra Necrozma. Spikes were nice as always, and it could toxic the newfound plethora of defoggers in the tier, such as Ho-Oh. Of course, Skarm had strong competition as a Steel-type wall, and all its other competition had excellent special bulk, which was a major driving factor in why they were more easy to slap on teams. Celesteela could stand in the way of the mighty Deoxys attack while spreading Leech Seed. Ferrothorn also provided Leech Seed and matched Skarm's spikes while checking Primal Kyogre, and Magearna and Necrozma Duskmane were excellent Xerneas counters. Still, what Skarmory did was important, and thus it found itself with a solid niche in Ubers once again. Generation 8 has seen Skarm have it tougher than ever as far as OU is concerned. It has excellent new steel flying competition in Corviknight, who can PP stall easily with pressure alongside Roost, packs Defog and Taunt just like Skarm, can set up and sweep with a terrific substitute bulk up set, and can maintain momentum with U-Turn. Now, what it doesn't have is spikes, but it has never been easier to deal with hazards than now thanks to the prominence of heavy duty boots, which completely ignore them. So the unthinkable has finally happened. Skarmory has dropped drop to UU, where it remains at the time of this video. There, it is excellent. It walls the most dangerous physical attackers in the tier, Crocodile, Bisharp, Mimikyu, and Lycanroc, as well as being a solid check to Terrakion, and generally being excellent at spreading chip damage thanks to Rocky Helmet. However, it's not just a wall. Gen 8 gifted Skarm one of the most amazing moves it could have asked for in Body Press, which turns its enormous defense stat into a weapon that allows it to dish out actual damage. Of course, Roost is also a given, but Skarm has a lot of flexibility in its last two move slots. With Iron Defense, it can make itself even bulkier and at the same time effectively stronger. Toxic threatens otherwise safe switch-ins like Keldeo and Rotom Wash. 
Iron Head is solid stab for Mimikyu and prevents Hatterene from switching in freely. Finally, good old spikes are always an option as heavy duty boots aren't as prominent on grounded Pokemon as they are in OU, meaning the spikes will still be useful for chipping away at dangerous top tier Pokemon like Jirachi and Kyurem as well as the aforementioned Keldeo and Terrakion. Skarman UU is still a new phenomenon, but it looks to be establishing itself as one of the metagame's premier Pokemon. And that's it, so how good was Skarmory actually? Well, it is no exaggeration to call it among the best singles Pokemon of all time. Emphasis on singles because this thing is useless in VGC. However, from generations 2 through 6, it was one of the best, most important Pokemon in OU. It was the definition of defense and made players everywhere either love or hate spikes depending on which side they were on. Even in Gen 7, where OU Skarm was at its lowest, it was still quite good. Sure, it wasn't as dominant as the previous 5 generations, I mean that's a tall task, but it was still solid. It's finally dropped to UU in Generation 8, where it is currently excelling. We've often said in these videos that new generations of UU resemble old generations of OU, and with Skarmory now roaming underused with its friend Tyranitar, perhaps this will inspire old players to give the newest generation a shot. So, that's been my time. I hope you guys enjoyed. I have my own channel where I do competitive Pokemon if you want to check it out. And Kellen, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much to our writer BKC for guest starring in this video. You should definitely go check out his channel as he has some of the best competitive Pokemon knowledge out there. And as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Wipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know, what do you think about competitive Skarmory? What would you give it to have it do something in VGC? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. Also, thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos and to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.